You, you want me to do what? You want me to describe how and why the United States claimed and settled the Upper Mississippi River region in the early 19th century? Okay, but I'm going to need a little help. But we'll, we'll get to that later. So, okay, it's a really long story, and it's so much bigger than Minnesota. So the United States became a country in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. At that time, Minnesota was a fur trading center. The English, the Americans, the French were all trading with the Anishinaabe and the Dakota, and the competition was heating up. As a result, the Dakota and Anishinaabe were starting to fight with each other a little bit more. The American colonies were fighting with the English too in the Revolutionary War, and the tension was felt here, which was known as the frontier. This was the edge of European civilization within North America, but obviously what was already here was, was very, you know, well established. Now, the Revolutionary War ended in 1783, and all of the lands east of the Mississippi River became part of the United States. A few years later, in 1787, a group of delegates wrote the Constitution, and once enough states ratified it, well, ratify, by the way, vocab check, ratify means you agree to follow something, okay? Well, once all the, you know, once he had nine of the 13 original colonies ratify that, we became a nation as we know it today. Um, in the Constitution, it said a few things. One of the things it said is that a territory had agreed with the Constitution to become a state, and it also said that American Indian tribes are considered nations that only the federal government can negotiate with. We'll get more to that in a little bit, but I need a little bit of help right now from somebody else. So here they go. So, in 1803, President Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase that doubled the size of the country and made most of the rest of Minnesota part of the United States. People like Lewis and Clark were sent into this new territory to explore it. A guy named Zebulon Pike explored up the Mississippi River into what we know today as Minnesota. He was looking for the source of the river and also a good place to build a fort. He secured a small pot plot of land from the Dakota for $2,000 and then nothing much happened to the land for 14 years. Today, that land is part of Fort Snelling and the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Several key events took place in the East that we'll cover in detail next year, but the main thing to know is that people started moving West. It was getting crowded along the East Coast and people wanted land West of the Appalachian Mountains. They started moving into new areas, settling towns. The United States negotiated with American Indian nations to purchase land and this massive westward expansion began. In 1830, the United States started removing American Indians from their land besides just purchasing it, and Americans began to feel a growing sense of national pride called Manifest Destiny. It was the belief that our nation should stretch from ocean to ocean, which, spoiler alert, is what we have today. One of the problems with that vision was that the leaders of the United States saw no way for the American Indians to fit into the system. They wanted the land that the Native Americans had always lived on. So they worked to get those lands by convincing the American Indian tribes and the nations of the American Indians to sign treaties. A treaty usually sold land to the U.S. government and set up a method of payment to the tribes. Some treaties also established areas reserved for American Indians, known later as reservations. Why did the United States want the land that we know today as Minnesota? Well, for one thing, it had some of the largest stands of timber in the world, and the United States desperately needed that timber to build newly formed towns in the east, in the south, and in the expanding west. California was already a state, and it was, you know, people were moving out that way. The timber was also needed to build a navy, as our country became larger and had to deal with world powers like the French and the British. The Mississippi River was a crucial trading path, and whoever controlled it would control trade in the area. The river was also a good source of power for sawmills. You could cut down logs up north and then use the river to transport them south to the sawmills. The prairie was also very fertile, and it was believed it would make for excellent cropland. So Minnesota was home to a lot of things. The river, the woods, the trees, well, I just said that. The rivers, the woods, the land, the, the farmland potential. There's a lot of reasons to come here. 
Throughout the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, the United States signed many treaties with the Anishinaabe and Dakota. The first treaty was signed in 1837 between the Dakota, Anishinaabe, and the United States. Before the U.S. could even pay for the land, lumbermen rushed into the pine forests along the St. Croix River and started cutting down trees. Additional treaties were signed, giving up more land, until each tribe was isolated on very small and remote areas of land scattered throughout the state. Check out this map to see the years when various treaties were signed. So why did the Anishinaabe and Dakota sign these treaties? At one level, they didn't feel like they had much of a choice. In the 1830s, the U.S. government started a policy known as Indian removal in the East. They began forcing American Indians from their lands simply because settlers wanted to live there instead. In the most well-known example, often called the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee people took the state of Georgia to court for violating their native lands. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in favor of the Cherokee, saying that they had every right under the Constitution to live there. President Jackson actually said that if that's how the Supreme Court felt, then they should enforce the law themselves. Shortly after that, federal troops removed the Cherokee and forced them to walk hundreds of miles from Georgia to Oklahoma. Of the 15,000 who were forced to move, over 4,000 died from the harsh conditions. Many of these trees were signed with armed soldiers nearby, or within the walls of fortresses like Fort Snelling. At one treaty gathering, the women and children who went with the men to the treaty meeting had cannons aimed at their camp while the treaty discussions were going on. On several occasions, U.S. government officials used this threat of force on the tribes if they didn't sign the treaty. To make matters worse, once the treaty was signed, Congress would often change some of the language of the agreement. A Dakota reservation that was declared permanent in a treaty was changed to being temporary. The amount of money promised in the treaty for the land was dropped because fur traders claimed that the tribe owed the money and they should get the money directly from the treaty payments. What consequences did these treaties have on the two nations? Both were forced to leave their native lands, their homes, and move to areas with others they were not used to living around. They had to share less than ideal land with others and made dependent upon the government for food and supplies. The Dakota and Anishinaabe were also encouraged to change their way of life and leave the reservation. Another issue the tribes had to deal with was the introduction of alcohol and alcoholism. Taken all together, this began a very dark time for the Dakota and Anishinaabe people that would continue to get worse. That's a big, that's a big name there. Um, we got steamboat transportation, right? That's pretty obvious. Transportation by a steamboat. Settlement. Settlement is new people coming in and living somewhere. Physical landscape. Physical landscape is what did the land look like? Um, society and culture is how the people um, live, how the people interact, uh, all those sorts of things. So what we're going to talk about here is how did steamboat transportation impact all those things? Um, as we talked about before, as soon as the ink dried on these treaties, settlers were ready to move in. Most of these people had no idea how the land was acquired, just that there was land available to them for a good cost. Sometimes the land was available at no cost, as long as they guaranteed to farm it for a number of years. There was no railroad to Minnesota at this time. There weren't even really roads to Minnesota from the east, other than a few trails. The main way that people could get up to this part of the country was on the Mississippi River. They hitched a ride on board one of the many steamboats that ran up and down the Mississippi, from New Orleans, all the way up through all the sorts of towns in the Long River, to Pig's Eye Landing which was later named, thank goodness, St. Paul. A, a, a much better name, yeah. Actually, now, these steamboats ran all the way to just downstream from St. Anthony Falls, which is right in the middle of what we know today as Minneapolis. St. Anthony Falls is the only major waterfall on the entire Mississippi River, and it's the reason why Minneapolis is located there. A waterfall is free energy. It's a great place to build a sawmill where you can use the power of the river to turn a saw blade for cutting wood. Now it sounds sort of silly, but the water flows over something that turns, 
That in turn is connected by a set of you know gears and pulleys and such, and eventually it leads to a saw blade. But what it's powered by is the river. Now this power source was later used to turn mills for making things like oh say flour, um, which we'll talk about in a future video. But Minneapolis is known as the Miller City, and a miller is somebody who grinds flour. These steamboats brought tons of people up the river. Like we said, these settlers either didn't fully understand how this land was acquired from the Dakota and Anishinaabe, or they fully believed that the tribes fairly sold the land and moved away. It's easy to blame settlers for what happened to the tribes, but it's not that simple. These settlers established towns, built stores, shops, and schools, started newspapers, became farmers, and created local governments with mayors, judges, city councils, and territorial governments. Many of the settlers were single men looking for employment, but women soon followed and there were plenty of children as well. They came from a variety of backgrounds as well, including some from wealthy families of the East all the way to immigrants fresh from the poorest regions of Europe and everywhere in between. They didn't always understand each other, like each other. Blah, blah, blah. They didn't always understand each other, like each other, or treat each other fairly but they created a territory that would eventually become a state we know today as Minnesota. Okay, so how did Minnesota go, how did it become a territory and then a state? Let's go through this really quick, okay? First, you get the land by signing treaties. Then, settlers start moving in from the east and traveling up the Mississippi River on steamboat. These settlers made villages and towns enough that the United States Congress agrees to make the area an official territory of the United States. In 1849, that's exactly what happened, and the white population of the state stood at only 5,000 people. Over the next few years, politicians in Minnesota discussed and debated boundaries for what they hoped would be a new state. This argument would be settled in Congress when boundaries of the new states are officially created. In 1857, Congress passed a law allowing Minnesota to begin the process of becoming a state. That year, a group of political leaders met in Stillwater to write a state constitution. After they finished it, the voters of the state had to vote to approve it and elect lawmakers and leaders. To approve the state constitution, 30,055 people voted in favor of it, and 571 voted against. So it was pretty much a landslide for being a state. Congress then passed a law making Minnesota a state, and it was official. On May 11th, 1858, the state of Minnesota was official. So this May 11th, well, maybe you want to make a cake or something and have a big party. It's Minnesota's birthday. Come on. By the way, why did Minnesota go from being a territory to a state so quickly? In the 1850s, the United States was having a very heated argument about slavery. Northern states wanted it to be illegal in new states, and territories, while southern states, where slavery was a major part of the economy, wanted the question of slavery to be decided by the people of that state. Because each state has an equal amount of senators in Congress, two per state, they knew that whoever had more states on their side would get their way. If there were more slave states than free states, those in favor of slavery would have more votes in Congress. If there were more free states than, than <clears throat> if there were more free states, then slavery could be made illegal. Minnesota was admitted to the Union as a free state, tipping the balance against slave states. While it's a great day in state history, it's also another event that brought us closer to the Civil War. As you can see, the story of Minnesota definitely has bumps and bruises. It's not a fairy tale story, that's for sure. And actually, if you can believe it, this was the tame version. There's a couple other crazy things in real life. There's actually a few more dirty details than you'll just have to learn about later on in life or, or dig up on your own. Because the story, there's, there's some crazy stuff that happened with this. So hopefully, you all know a bit now about how Minnesota went from being run by the Anishinaabe and the Dakota, how it changed hands and became what we know today as the state of Minnesota.